So when people say he doesn't have this top tier skill set, well, he doesn't from a traditional standpoint, but he's got other things that other quarterbacks that Joe Burrow doesn't have, that Justin Herbert doesn't have. So here to me is the biggest question. Can the Eagles accept that? Can the Eagles accept building around the unique skill set of Jalen Hurts? To date, I would say no. Je Jeffrey Lurie has been honest. He wants a high efficiency passing offense. If that holds up, the Eagles don't have their quarterback. If they start being a little bit more open-minded and say, all right, let's build around what this kid does well, then they might have a quarterback. And, yeah. and you know what else? Each and every day, uh, Monday through Friday, uh, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern time, uh, our next guest does a great job with Jody Mack on Birds 365. You can also check out his work, jacobsports.com. Does an excellent job covering, covering the birds in the NFL for Jacob Sports Network, John McMullen. What's up, John? What's what's up? Good to see you guys. It's what's going on, man? John, nope. it's all good. Nope. It's, it's the first day. It's it's the bloom, man. It's the blossom of yeah. football. How about season. that? I love it. Yeah, Christmas hey, Eve. Hey, John, yes, you miss you miss the days of standing outside the dorms and watching players taking all their expensive toys, while we're yeah. out there in the sweltering heat, 150 degrees. Do you miss those moments, John? I do not, Derek. I do Thank not. But, you know, it's a new world. I, I do question the preparation aspect of it. I, I think our buddy Ruben Frank was the one who pointed out, you know, as Dick Vermeil goes into the Hall of Fame, he, he figured out in Dick's first year, he did the math, probably had 180 hours of preparation time, and now we're down to about 20. That's, that's, that's where we are. Now, they played six preseason games back then. That didn't right. make any sense either, no. so – um, there's some good, there's some bad to it, but it, it just is what it is. I know Kyler Murray isn't going to bring his iPad to some college dorm <laughs> to do his four hours of independent study. I know Sounds that. like he's not bringing it to his mansion either, yeah. John. Yeah. You know, wow. That's, yeah. is that not the most bizarre thing? You, you're going to hand the guy 230 million, but you clearly don't trust him. No. But, and, and you know, I, I laugh about it. It's tough not to, but. That's kind of the positive. It it highlights the positive of Jalen Hurts. Like we're yeah. we're we're almost I always describe Jalen as as you know almost the polar opposite of what you have with, with young quarterbacks. You're usually worried about the intangibles. You're usually yeah. worried, all right, I know this guy can do this. I know this guy can do this from a physical standpoint. But you don't know if he's going to be the leader, the hard worker, the the, the understanding, doing all the homework. Um, with Jalen, you know he's doing all that. You know it. You know he's going to be prepared. And the Eagles describe it as, we know he's going to reach a ceiling as a player. Just what is that ceiling as a player? Yeah, and it's almost become like a passe job. Because if you point that kind of stuff out, people are like, whatever, man, can he play? But that is a big deal. I mean, Oh, it's a real big deal. You know, you know he's going to work his tail off. You know he's got the locker room. You know he has the support from the players. Mm -hmm. You know the coaches respect the fact that the guy goes about it as a professional. And I know ultimately at the end of the day he's got to play well on the field. But, but to have those intangibles at 22, 23, whatever, that it takes sometimes guys to get – you know, 27, 28 to develop is a big deal. It's it's rare. It's very rare. I mean, you usually got to go through all these hiccups and learning, uh, uh, you know, circumstances. And he's got all that stuff. And, and you know, <clears throat> the one thing I've also kind of started to look at when it comes to Jalen Hurts is, you know, people say he isn't special throwing the football. You know, you saw Mike Sandoz. You you guys probably saw his yeah. – he does that annual the rankings. Uh, right, tier right. ratings. And, you know, I think it's very valuable because you get to see inside the the movers and shakers' minds, so to speak. Um, And, you know, I, I go back to the spring when we got a chance to talk to Nick Sirianni. And, and Nick has always said since he's gotten here, he said there's four traits he looks for in quarterbacks. Uh, accuracy is number one. Decision-making, number two. 
um, movement skills, um, extending plays, things like that, uh, and arm strength. The Eagles check the box, even though some people don't believe it. Jalen Hurts has the arm strength to, to make all the throws. The, his issues with that usually comes with getting the ball out a little bit too late. Um, and obviously, he's tremendous when it comes to off-schedule stuff. So, you know, Nick went back and he said, you know what? I'm starting to debate whether the off-schedule stuff is just as important as decision-making because – and he described it as sometimes you don't know what you have until you have it. And he's so good at that stuff. So when people say he doesn't have this top tier skill set, well, he doesn't from a traditional standpoint. But he's got other things that other quarterbacks that Joe Burrow doesn't have, that Justin Herbert doesn't have. So here to me is the biggest question. Can the Eagles accept that? Can the Eagles accept building around the unique skill set of Jalen Hurts? To date, I would say no. Je Jeffrey Lurie has been honest. He wants a high-efficiency passing offense. If that holds up, the Eagles don't have their quarterback. If they start being a little bit more open-minded and say, all right, let's build around what this kid does well, then they might have a quarterback. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's the a million dollar question, John. Are they willing to go the Lamar Jackson <laughs> route that Harbaugh went to and said, you know, hey, this may be what we did with Flacco, but forget it. Look, we're going to play to his skill set and this is the way we're going to do it. It's the million dollar question whether they're willing to do that. I think they would prefer a Justin Herbert type. I mean, who? Won? Oh, yeah. No but, question. But, you know, I, I think that's. That and that goes to the highest reaches, like you said, Lori, Howie, and then Nick. Nick may be willing, but I don't know if the people above Nick are willing. Well, in the evidence we have is they're not. Right. They just went out and paid a receiver a hundred million dollars. All right, they're not paying AJ Brown to not get the football. Yep. So I think that kind of tells you all you need to know. One, I think the one thing we have to be concerned with is, and it's a minor concern right now, is. But if you cater to Jalen Hurd's strengths, could it handcuff other aspects of the offense? You know, we we all agree there are things he needs to work on. And we've heard all the stories since the season ended that he's putting in the work. Um, he's out on the West Coast working with the quarterback gurus. He's in the film study. He's in the building. But 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 what are other than his his legs? What are his strengths? Because we've spent so much time breaking down the things that we've seen that he needs to get better at, whether it's going through progressions, being more accurate with the football, getting the ball out of his hands quicker. So if the team identifies that we have to cater our offensive play calling to his strengths, could it handcuff certain other areas of the offense? Yeah, it definitely could. I mean, and I bring up A.J. Brown for that reason. I mean, you didn't bring him in here to, to right. block, right. Um, you, to, to run a bunch of zone reads. It's evident what the Eagles want. They want to be effective throwing the football, especially on, on third downs and key situations, um, red zones. Um, that's the kind of stuff Jalen needs to improve on because you do have to improve on that. You, don't, right. you, you know, D Gun, if you look at his passing charts last year, I always say they should be uh, sponsored by Dunkin' Donuts. He didn't throw the oh, football geez. in the middle of the field. <laughs> it, there's this big hole in the middle of the field, and yeah. he's got AJ Brown yeah. and Dallas Goddard. You got to trust those guys. Yep. You know he clearly doesn't feel comfortable throwing the football. A lot of bad things can happen if you're not accurate throwing the football over the middle of the field. Tip ball, interception that's coming the other way. So, number one, he's got to trust what he sees. Number two, he's got to trust his receivers, and his receivers have to produce. But you know A.J. Brown and Dallas Goddard are high-level players. So mm -hmm. there's plenty of mo room for improvement. The problem is there's not room to become Justin <laughs> Herbert or Joe Burrow as a passer. So there's got to be some give and take, or otherwise – you know, this is all just wasting time. You're mm -hmm. going to be looking for another quarterback. And, yeah, and, and John, the other part that that, that sort of uh, is intriguing here is you're always wrestling. He's only 23. 
quarterbacks get better. You know, even in this society, we want everything tomorrow, you know, yesterday to be the greatest. <coughs> but your, the practicality of the contract situation where he doesn't have that fifth year as yeah. a second round pick yeah. makes this year even all the more critical in terms of what are you going to do long term here? You don't want him going into that fourth year as a lame duck. You know, if this year is just OK, you know, what do you do if you're the front office? And I, I think that for all those reasons, this is just gigantic this year that he that he takes a big leap yeah. forward. I mean, I think they have to make a decision after this year. I, I've heard people, Jody says it. Night Zach Berman on the show. He said it yesterday um, that the Eagles could let him play out his fourth year. T- two things with that. Yeah, they could, obviously. Um, that's not typically the way they do business. They want to identify guys early and extend them. They know the price is only going up. Mm-hmm. I got sticker shock from Kyler Murray's contract. Ridiculous I was contract. Like, I was like, wow. And and then you have Lamar's coming up. Yeah. Um, uh, Joe Burrow coming up. You have Justin Herbert coming up. So when you start talking about the franchise tag two years down the road, well, what the heck is the franchise tag going to be? Exactly. It's going to be $35 to $40 million minimum. Yeah. Minimum. So are you comfortable with that? But going back to um, this off, this upcoming offseason, uh, so Jalen will be eligible for an extension for the first time. All right, two things there. You don't want to go into any season with a lame duck quarterback. You don't want a lame duck quarterback, and you don't want a lame duck coach. The locker room knows what that means. They know what that means. Now, if if you <clears throat> offer Jalen a contract and he says, you know what? No, I don't want it. Uh, I want to bet on myself. I can take more money. That's different right. than saying, all right, just play out the fourth year. Then you're a lame duck. Then you're a lame duck. That's not going to work. That's not how the Eagles do business, period. And I don't see them changing. Then the second part is we can't just assume you can kick the can down the road. You're always going to have three first-round picks or two first-round picks. You just came out of it this year, bad quarterback draft. You know, if you have a good quarterback draft, you better seize that moment. So for all those reasons, this is it. The Eagles are going to make a decision on Jalen Hurts after this season. Yep. No question about it. John, when I look at other positions on this team, I think one of the most intriguing positions to keep an eye on is that right tackle spot. I know a lot of people think Isaac Sayamalu is is on lockdown, but I don't see it that way. Now, Isaac is a good, good player, very good player. And he's tutored by one of the best offensive line mentors in the game today. But I think it's a little bit more wide open than that because of some of the options they have there. Yeah, they really like Jack Driscoll. And they they really think they stumbled on to something. You know, he came in as a right tackle. And people thought he was going to back up there with mm-hmm. Lane. And um, all of a sudden, he's got to play in right guard. And they go, wow, he's pretty good. Uh, but he's had injury problems himself. He hasn't yeah. been able to to finish a couple of years. I think it comes down to Isaac and Jack. Um, here's the thing with Isaac. Isaac told us in the spring. Now he was out there, but he was not fully clear. So remember, they were doing. He was working in individual drills, doing some light work, but he had two surgeries uh, for the Liz Frank injury. You have to put the hardware in as he calls it, and you have to take the hardware out. So it's a really, really serious injury. It's a really serious injury even more so for 300-pound guys. I mean, that's that's a foot injury uh, at a position where you put a lot of stress on your, on your feet. Um, so number one, we have to see if Isaac is healthy, if he's ready to go. He might be a candidate to start on the pup list. Uh, so we'll have to keep an eye on that over the next 24 hours. Um, but yeah, you're right, D. Gun. Jack Driscoll is, I think, a bigger uh, candidate than people realize because the yeah. Eagles. And and by the way, the head coach loves him. The head yeah. coach loves him, Jack Driscoll. Mm. John, how do you see the, the the linebacking core? And I know this is going to look a little bit different considering some of the things they do up front with the guys in front of them. But um, there's a lot of people believe N'Kobe Dean maybe from day one has a chance. Some people think it's going to take him a little while to get acclimated. 
They bring in Kaiser White. TJ Edwards, I thought, had a pretty good <clears> year, <throat> all things considered. Maybe doesn't get the kind of love from some folks. But how do you see the linebacking core? Uh, yeah. Out? I, you know, I'm writing about this on, on Jacob Sports, right? And I stopped to jump on with you guys. This, Nicobe Dean, for a couple reasons. One, he was so good in college. I mm-hmm. mean, he was phenomenal. And then I think fans were sort of inundated with this is a surefire first round pick for months and months leading up to the draft. And all of a sudden he falls to the third round. There's some injury concerns around the league. Um, And I think people have the perception of this is a first round pick. This is going to be a day one starter. I don't think he's going to be a day one starter. Mm -hmm. I, I think the hope with N'Kobe Dean is maybe the second half of the season. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can ramp him up and he starts to, <clears throat> to get it. We just talked about the health of Isaac Sam. There's another guy I'm interested in. There were teams in this league that took him off the board yeah. because of health issues. The Eagles say he's fine. They didn't do anything in the spring. He was out there, but they didn't do any 11 on 11 work. Um, the linebackers weren't involved. They started with TJ and Kaiser White. He was on the third team to start. I think it's going to be a slower ramp up period than people realize with Nicobe Dean. And it starts with health. I have to see if he's healthy, number one. And forget about the long term, <clears throat> there's concerns over his shoulder, his knee, long term, degenerative conditions. He strained his pec mm-hmm. and he might not be ready at the beginning of camp. So we have to see that. If he's ready, uh, and I've said this on a number of occasions, and and, and uh, basically similar to what you've said, I can see them slowly increasing his his playing time as they go along. I think initially he's going to be that situational linebacker, especially in passing downs. I need you to get to the quarterback. You know, as good as he is as an all around athlete in terms of tackling, defending the run, I thought his finest attribute was being able to slip through gaps with his speed and his agility slipping through gaps and getting the quarterbacks off their spot and making quarterbacks extremely uncomfortable back there and forcing them to make decisions a lot sooner than they want to. And I can see them having, you know, uh, I seen Reddick on one side and Nicobe Dean on the other side. Hey, I'll meet you at the quarterback type scenarios. Yeah. Well, I, People aren't going to like this, but I'm going to say it anyway. (laughs) Go ahead. Take them off. Let's go, John. The Eagles aren't going to blitz a lot. I'm sorry. They're not. No, man, don't say that. You just injure. Yeah. There's some injuries in, in, the, yeah. uh, in the stream. In the, I mean, in the they're chat. not. And and to me, it's going to be, you know, Hassan Reddick is here to rush the quarterback. Um, and I think he's going to do it very well. Josh Sweat is an emerging player. Uh, I think an underrated player. Brandon's back. Derek's back. Uh, Teron Jackson, Milton Williams on it. They're very deep up front. I don't think you're going to see a lot of blitzing linebackers. Um, and 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 by the way, I don't consider Hassan Reddick a, a linebacker. Right? He, you know, people, Hybrid. yeah, yeah, he's he's an edge defender. So people have this old four three versus three four trope, which drives me nuts. Um, the Eagles are basically going to play Big Bangio's defense, which they call a, it, it, you know. Well, number one, I'll say this. Base defense is not base defense. Base defense is the nickel, right? Avante Maddox is a starter. He's out there 65, 70% of the time. So that that's one people have to get that out of their mind. Then what are the Eagles going to look like when Jordan Davis is out there stuffing the run? I think mainly you're going to see a 5-2 overhang look is what Gannon calls it. Reddick on the line of scrimmage, Josh Sweat on the line of scrimmage. Um, and then who's playing inside next to Davis? That to me is the most interesting question because there's a lot of avenues they can go. They can go big. They can go Fletcher. They can go Javon. Brandon can play that four eye technique. Um, um, Derek Barnett can play it. Milton Williams can play it. They have a lot of talent up front and a lot of ways they can go. Unfortunately, when you talk about Nicobe Dean on third downs and blitzing, I don't think that's one of them. Not that he can't do it. It's just not going to be a staple of this defense. Or I should better say, 
they don't want it to be a staple of this defense. They want to get home with the rushers they have. They don't want to have to blitz. John, do, do you worry just staying on that for a minute? That it, it feels like there is a lot of moving parts here. It, it, look, it's great that you have the skill set and the, and the adaptive players to be able to do it. That's great. But do you worry at all that it's just a lot? Uh, and these guys with limited practice, limited, you know, whatever, and some of the other questions that are out there may struggle getting it all down? Or you think, you know, this they're going to be good to go? No, they, they played this last year. Um, they just didn't play it successfully because, you know, Gennard Avery was in the Hassan Reddick role. Mm-hmm. Um, Javon Hargrave is playing on the nose at times. Fletcher, as we know, doesn't want to play on the nose, nor should they. Um, and they didn't have the Jordan Davis type to to put in that particular position. Um and the same with, with the Sam linebacker. They didn't have uh, an Hassan Reddick type to put in that position. So they were already playing it. They just couldn't play it as much as they wanted to, and they couldn't play it as effectively as they wanted to. So I think when you went through early last season, you remember when Fletcher Cox was complaining a little bit, that was about playing that four-eye technique. Not used to it. Played three – three technique under Jim Schwartz, loved it. Go get to the quarterback, pin your ears back, you know, defend the run on your way to the quarterback. That's a lot of fun for a defensive tackle. Um, When you're asked to be more disciplined and more, you know, they call it one and a half gaps. It's not really two gaps, Uh, more read and react. It's not as fun, but they were already doing it last year. So I don't think it'll, it'll be that much of a problem. Do you think with Bradbury and, and Darius Slay out there, they're going to go play more press coverage than they did last year, more man-to-man type on the back end? No, because they don't have the safeties to do it. Um, you're, not, you're not a Tart fan? No. I mean, <laughs> you, you know what, D-Gun? Nothing against right. uh, Chikwaski Tart because right. he's played a lot of football on good defenses. Right. Uh, San Francisco's been a good defense. But the contract tells you all you need to know. Mm -hmm. And then the year before, San Francisco brought him back on the veteran minimum. So they know him better than anyone. Right. They brought him back for 2021 on a one-year veteran minimum deal. This time around, they didn't even want him. That tells me something. Mm -hmm. Um, Anthony Harris tells me something. The Eagles brought him in one year, $5 million. Two years ago, he was a franchise tag player in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Now he's back at one year, two and a half million. That tells me something. Um, Marcus Epps, look, great kid. Um, you know, he's a walk on at Wyoming. He was a six round pick. He's a waiver wire uh, pickup. That tells me something. But, you know, more than that, what tells me the most? I think people forget about this because the Eagles are very good about making you forget about this. They wanted to sign Marcus Williams. Yep. They were mm-hmm. kicking the tires on, on Tyron Matthew, Matthew uh, the honey badger. They knew they had to get better at safety. They weren't able to accomplish that. But other than safety, mm-hmm. Howie did a great job in the off season. So John, with, with all that said, um, where do you think they are as we sit here right now? I mean, how good are they? What are they, what should the expectation level be a team that made the playoffs last year did get smoked in that, in the one game that they played, but what should the expectation level be for this team? Uh, it should be winning the NFC East. I mean, um, they've gotten better. The Cowboys, at least on paper, have gotten a little bit worse. Um, so they seem to be coming back to you a little bit. And so it should be an incremental improvement. And then when you get to the playoffs, you don't want to be embarrassed. You want to be competitive. So the expectations are much higher, and that's going to be much more difficult on the head coach, the defensive coordinator, and the quarterback. Those are the three guys. Uh, Big-time expectations, um, but they should be in the conversation, certainly, to win the NFC East. There's no reason to think they shouldn't um, have a chance to to, to win the NFC East. What's your belief level in Gannon? Uh, personally, yeah. um, I, I have a lot of respect uh, for John, Jonathan. Um, 
you know, there's a reason he got three head coaching interviews, three different teams. I mean, three different organizations. I mean, how he how he says they're running him, they are running him. He's not going to be here long term. And this is it. You know, I've talked about this a lot. It's rare you get the band back together uh, from a coaching staff standpoint in the NFL. There's always changes. Um, there were no changes uh, for the Eagles this year. That won't happen next year because mm -hmm. one of two things is going to happen. They're going to meet these expectations, and then people are going to hire Gannon or Shane Steichen or Brian Johnson or one of these high-profile assistants or they don't live up to the expectations, and then Jeffrey Lurie is going to come looking for the scapegoat like he did with Mike Groh and Carson Walsh. So this is it for this coaching staff. I'll give you a little bit more in the Marcus Williams scenario. The Eagles actually thought they had a deal in place with him. Yeah. And yeah, all of a sudden, were... Baltimore came in in the 11th hour and stole it. They went him. nuclear. Yeah. Yeah, they went nuclear and gave him more money than the Eagles could afford at that particular time or wanted to pay him. But if they had gotten it, they thought that safety spot was going to be solidified. They thought they had dead to rights. and But that's part of football also, man. You know, yeah. you, you know, now, especially nowadays, the way they're throwing money around, you know, monopoly money being thrown around. You look at, you know, wide receivers getting ungodly money nowadays. Yeah. You know, in, in Arizona, basically, I said it last week, all Arizona did was tick off other teams now that have to uh, deal with their quarterbacks when their time come up, comes up either this year or after this season, you know, and, you know, you can't give Howie enough kudos for at least trying, you know, you don't get everything yeah. you want. You hope you get most of what you want, but you don't get everything you want. Now in this game. you always have, a, you, you always need a contingency. Like I said, the Eagles yeah. are good about the Eagles wanted Russell Wilson. Let's be honest. I yeah. mean, if they could have convinced him to, you know, consider Philadelphia, they would have went all in. Um, I don't believe they would have went as high as Cleveland ultimately did or Deshaun Watson money wise, right, but right. they, they love the player. I mean, they, they, they think the player would have been a significant upgrade. Um, you can talk about the other stuff, but um, you don't get, as you mentioned, uh, Derek, you don't get everything you want. So you have to have contingency plans. I thought the Eagles did a really good job with most of their contingency plans. You know, sometimes the contingency plan is better. I'll give you an example of that. They wanted to bring in Trey Waynes, a cornerback, who's a former first-round pick in Minnesota, was injured, you know, it's a history with Gannon. Um, Waynes is thinking about retiring. He said, you know what, I'm probably done. Um, all of a sudden, James Bradbury gets released. You get a better player. That wasn't the original plan. Ended up being better. So sometimes the contingency – same thing happened at receiver. Receiver, they wanted Calvin Ridley. Yep. After Calvin yep. Ridley, they wanted Allen Robinson. Yep. After Allen Robinson, they wanted Robert Woods. Oh, and yep. Kristen Kirk as well before Allen Robinson. They wanted all those guys, couldn't get any of them, and forced them to go out and get A.J. Brown. Now, they had to pay a premium in the force of, you know, first-round pick, third-round pick, $100 million. But they got the better player of, of those five receivers – they got the best of those five receivers. I always go back, John, to when they were hunting for safeties and they end up with Malcolm Jenkins. Everybody wanted Jarius Bird and TJ yeah, Ward. Right. That's right. You know, and you look at the way that played out, man, it couldn't have been better for the Eagles. Yeah. 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 So. Sometimes that happens quite a bit. Um, at safety, I don't think it happened for the Eagles. Other mm. positions, it may have happened. Last one for me, John. Uh, what do you see here for Miles Sanders this season and his future here with the Eagles? I think Miles is a good player. Um, I think this will be it for him in Philadelphia. A um, couple of reasons. The Eagles don't value the position. They're just going to turn it over. They won't want to pay big money to a running back. And mm -hmm. they kind of know, you know, you saw it with Boston Scott, Jordan Howard. A lot of people can run behind this particular offensive line because it's so good. But I do, you know, I do think that uh, people have unrealistic expectations when it comes to Miles Sanders and the fact that they're looking for that 1,250, 1,300 yard back. They don't exist anymore, guys. You can go back three years, right? Three years, 
Here are the guys who've had 1,250 yards in a season. Derrick Henry, Jonathan Taylor, um, Nick Chubb, Dalvin Cook, Christian McCaffrey. That's it. That's it. Um, Miles Sanders isn't that type of back. Uh, But he is. You can get to 1,000. You can get to 1,100 if he stays healthy. He would have he would have gotten a thousand last year if he stayed healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, so it depends what your expectations are. But Miles is a good player, not a great player. And the Eagles, Nick Sirianni wants to use two backs. And the problem for Miles is Kenny Gainwell is going to be the third down, the hurry up back. So kind of limits things at least a little bit from that perspective. I, I I agree with John in the sense that this could be the swan song for Miles Sanders in Philadelphia, but I will also throw this out here. Uh, the fact that I don't think Miles is going to get big money on the open market, you know, because th- that doesn't happen for a lot of running backs. And I, I still think if the Eagles desire to keep him, he could fall in a financial category that would be feasible for the organization. He's still a young back and he already knows Nick Sirianni's system. So I, I, I do believe First and foremost, that we are looking at the last days of Miles Sanders here in Philadelphia because of how the Eagles value the running back position. But there's a small part of me that wouldn't be surprised if he returned here because he would be favorable financially for this team to bring him back in 2023. Well, I'll tell you the best way for that to happen is probably not a good avenue for the Eagles because if he gets hurt again, misses five, six games, then I think you can bring him back on a cost-effective deal. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if he want that. So it's yeah. kind of a, a, a catch 22. Mm-hmm. Yeah. John, good stuff. So tomorrow, uh, just let everybody know what we're, what we're looking for on, on Jacobsports.com from you, just to reiterate. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm talking about those five perceptions that people, you know, the downtime in the NFL, it was show people talk themselves into things and, and these perceptions become facts. So there's five things I'm looking at that people think are true right now. And as soon as training camp starts, they'll quickly realize, oh, they're going in a different direction. Great. <laughs> All right. So we're looking forward to talking to you throughout camp, uh, getting some some uh, your observations from what you're seeing uh, down there. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, man. It gets rocking and rolling tomorrow with some practice. But, John, thanks, man. We appreciate your time. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, All right, man. John McMullen. I catch him every single day, uh, Birds 365, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. with Jody Mack. All right. Good insight there from John, Derek. That's for sure. We come back, we're going to go with our biggest knowns and unknowns of this team. When we get back, we'll continue with the Eagles discussion as they start camp. They they do report today, all right, and they are officially on the field tomorrow. So looking forward to that. A little later, some Phillies mixing some other odds and ends. Brian Baldinger coming up at 2 o'clock as well. So we'll talk to him in a little bit. Derek Gunn, Rob Ellis, Sports State, Jacob Sports YouTube Network. All right, I want to tell you about my friends at Pro Action Restoration. You say to yourself, what is Pro Action Restoration? Well, if you have a home, you have a business, you have a property, and you've experienced water damage, flooding, fire, smoke, mold problems, whatever the case may be, that is their expertise. They can handle it. And you know what? If you're not really sure, reach out, give them a call. Pro Action's on call 24 hours, seven days a week to assist you. I've had an issue where I had to call them on a Saturday. They were right over. They cleaned it up. Reasonable price. I couldn't have been happier. They are unbelievable. And that started the relationship with this great company. They're licensed, bonded, fully insured. They've been serving the tri-state area for more than two decades. Pro Action will work in conjunction with your insurance company as well. Again, it could be anything from water to fire to smoke damage to mold remediation. You name it. They can handle it. Give them a call, 610-623-3760. That's 610-623-3760. Or reach them online at ProActionRestoration.com. That's ProActionRestoration.com. 